this is Burton Holmes. For more than half a century, I've been traveling all over this wonderful world of ours, making pictures and gathering information. But I believe that one picture is more effective than a thousand words. I try with my pictures to give you the idea that you are really traveling in the country about which I'm speaking, and that you are learning by actual personal observation the things you want to know and ought to know. To the people of the United States, these stern and rock-bound coasts are a symbol of New England and of the beginnings of our history in this country. This stone tower at Newport, Rhode Island may have been built by the Vikings around the year 1000, when Leif, Severic the Red, and his Norsemen are thought to have been the first of the European explorers to reach America and tell the tales that brought the pilgrims to this shore, which they called Plymouth, in 1620. Storms had driven their ship, the Mayflower, from its course as they tried to reach Virginia, where the first of the English colonies to survive had been founded in 1607. The pilgrims were seeking a land where they would be free to practice Christianity as they wished. They crossed the Atlantic in a ship as small as this one, the Arabella, which brought the Puritans of the Massachusetts Bay Company here in 1630. Here they hoped to found a new England that would give them a new security and independence. Some of the colonists hoped to make fortunes in the new world. Others hoped only to own farms or to start businesses that would grow as the country developed. The first years were very hard. The people lived in huts or cabins that they could build quickly and yet that would protect them from the snows of winter. They had first to clear the land and plant food crops before they could take time to saw out boards and build the type of houses to which they were accustomed in England. They were the pioneers who set the example of courage for later pioneers who opened the rest of the country. The pilgrims' friendliness with Massasoit was an example that should have been followed more often with the Indians. But out of these years of hardship, homes were built, and gradually a new country was born. The old state house in Boston was built by the British, symbolizing English government. Yet by 1770, the English colonies in America were no longer dependent on the mother country. The Boston Massacre was a symbol of the fight for freedom that the colonists felt was necessary. Here in Faneuil Hall, the colonists held fiery debates, arguing for what they believed to be their rights of independence, the right to govern themselves, the right to conduct their own business, their farming, fishing, manufacturing, shipping. New ideas were shaped by these sons of the men and women who had fought the wilderness. And the people of New England live today among constant reminders of their heritage. Here is the grave of Benjamin Franklin's parents. Here is the grave of John Hancock, first signer of the Declaration of Independence. Samuel Adams, another signer. And Paul Revere, silversmith and patriot typical of the people who lived in small homes like his own in Boston, typical of the thousands of small craftsmen, farmers, merchants, who felt their cause to be just and the price of independence not too high if it cost their lives. To the old North Church, Revere looked for the signal lanterns, one if by land and two if by sea, so that he might warn his countrymen if the British soldiers set out from Boston to fight the Minutemen. At Lexington, the order was given, stand your ground, don't fire unless fired upon. But if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. At Concord, the same day, a few hours later, April 19th, 1775, was fired the shot heard round the world. At Lexington and at the Concord Bridge, the first battles were fought by the untrained Continental armies against the trained professional redcoats of the British. 
The quiet countryside of Concord rang with the shots that gave proof of the determination of the 13 English colonies to fight for the economic and religious independence that they had already acquired. And for the political independence they felt was their right. The colonists showed that they were united in their demands and that even the British use of force could not alter their beliefs. The colonists were defeated at Lexington and Concord, and they lost again at Bunker Hill. But on Breed's Hill, they held their own against the vaunted British troops and learned that they could win, win battles, win the war. They took heart and did win, so that government of their own choosing, represented by the state capital in Boston, would be the law of the land a law that united all the states, from the smallest, like Rhode Island, to the largest, that guaranteed religious tolerance, such as Roger Williams stood for, to all the people. Today, Boston is one of the greatest of American cities. It is a gateway to the sea, a center still of New England farms, fishing, manufacturing, shipping. It is a center of finance, it has absorbed thousands of Europeans into its New England culture, which began with its founding over 300 years ago. It is known as the hub of the universe. Symphony Hall, with its splendid music, like the modern streets, new buildings, and the sharp New England mind, are all a part of a culture that is well represented by its most famous university, Harvard. Whether the buildings are old or new, the spirit is ever modern. The lessons of the past are added to the lessons of the present. Harvard is a symbol of the demand of the New Englanders from the very beginning for a sound education. It was founded in 1636 and named after a benefactor, John Harvard, as a college for the training of ministers. It is the oldest university in the United States and the most famous. The enormous knowledge of Harvard indicated by its Widener Library, is paralleled by other famous New England schools, Yale, Brown, Dartmouth, Bowdoin, Wellesley, Radcliffe, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, all adding their share toward New England's culture. The culture may at times seem to show extremes of wealth. At Newport, Rhode Island, there is a millionaire's playground, magnificent homes with cars and yachts to go with them where the socially elite of yesteryear entertained lavishly during the summer months, spending millions of dollars. But this is not typical of New England. Much more typical is the life in the countryside, as in the green mountains of Vermont, where the church, the meeting hall, is the center of each community, where farming is the mainstay of life. These rivers and hills used to be Indian hunting grounds. Towns like St. Johnsbury grew up first as farming villages. Then industries developed, one or two industries in a single town. St. Johnsbury produces weighing scales, small scales for druggists, huge scales for railroads and ships. The town also produces maple syrup and maple sugar, so that the work of these people goes out all over the country. The rivers and lakes offer a bountiful supply of water for hydroelectric plants where electricity may be generated for running factories. But despite its many industries, New England remains largely an agricultural land following traditions as old as the country itself. Like the covered bridges, they may seem old-fashioned to those who don't know them. But just as the covering of a bridge is a very practical way of dealing with heavy winter snows, so is the rural New England way of life a very practical and sensible one. The people do the best with what they have to work with, and they do without whatever they can't afford. The chief source of income for Vermont farmers is from dairy products. The hay this farmer is gathering is for his cows. Their milk is sold in Boston or New York and from this he will receive the largest part of his cash income. In this way, the farms of New England produce most of the food for their own people, and at the same time, each farm is almost self-sufficient. 
Out of the pioneer tradition of each family's producing what it needs, each farm remains a sturdy, independent unit as closely knit and solid as the old farmhouses themselves with their continuous architecture. The farmhouse and barns are connected by sheds that allowed the old-time farmer to care for his cattle and work in his shops despite the heavy winter snows. In the summer, his cows could range over the open countryside. But the New Englander is not only a farmer and a manufacturer, he is also a sailor and fisherman. He has always built ships like these along the coast of Maine. He builds all types of ships, from fishing boats to yachts. The men of Maine live always close to water. The land itself is mountainous, but there are 2,500 miles of coastline, over 2,000 lakes and ponds, and over 5,000 rivers and streams. The clam fisherman represents the thousands who bring in clams and lobsters, cod, and all the other fish that have for centuries been brought to ports from Maine to Connecticut. Yet the traditions of New England have still another side, that of constant respect for the arts, painting, architecture, music, literature. These are practical expressions of their emotion, imagination, and sense of beauty. A portrait of Booth Tarkington is natural here, where the writer spent his summers with his schooner, where artists of all types find places and people that are congenial down to earth. Booth Tarkington is best known for his books Penrod and The Magnificent Ambersons. But his writings are only a small part of New England's literature. Longfellow's home reminds us of the brilliant period in the last century when New England writers, writing out of their own surroundings, such as the Wayside Inn, brought New England to the attention of the entire world. The lives, the struggles, the visions of the people who had built this land were portrayed. The simple life of water wheels and grist mills was seen in its relation to the soul. Life that flows as constantly as water and is employed in such simple tasks as grinding corn for meal was analyzed for its eternal values. Writers who are among the greatest in American literature wrote of their own New England. Here at Orchard House, Louisa May Alcott wrote Little Women. Henry David Thoreau, as independent in his thinking as Benjamin Franklin, lived here at Walden Pond alone and wrote his book, Walden, a book as natural and free as the woods around him. Emerson, from a modest Massachusetts home, pronounced ideas that startled the people of his times, times that we remember through the writings of James Russell Lowell, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Whittier, Emily Dickinson, Henry Adams, Nathaniel Hawthorne. In the half century from 1830 to 1880, New England literature, written from places like Hawthorne's wayside home and written about such houses as the Old Manse, dominated American letters. The writers won for themselves permanent places in the world's thinking, and they won the heartfelt appreciation of their own countrymen, who remember them by erecting monuments such as this statue of Hawthorne. The New England writers of today know that they will be remembered just as Hawthorne's unhappy days as a clerk in the Salem Custom House are thought of in connection with his writing The House of Seven Gables, The Scarlet Letter, or his short stories. The men who go down to the sea in ships, the Gloucester fishermen, these men are of the type the writers have known, salty, shrewd, daring. They have made history. Salem was known to the sailors and merchants of the Seven Seas in the days of the old clipper ships. Back to here they brought their wealth, built fine homes, and settled down among traditions as familiar to them as the stories of the old Puritan days, days of witch hunting and of strict religious laws. The pilgrims and Puritans were very strict in their religious beliefs and practices and punished all offenders publicly in the stocks, where they might receive whippings or simply be held up to ridicule, whether men or women. But today the churches have given up such harshness. They do, though, keep the early tradition of hard, clear thinking, 
They worship as their consciences dictate, but allow each man to worship in whatever way he feels is best. The severity is gone, and there are churches whose tradition in architecture goes back to medieval times to stained glass. The peoples of other creeds and nationalities who followed the early English settlers to this country have been free to build churches according to their beliefs. The stained glass in itself is an art of a type that interests New Englanders. The work of the early craftsmen, now antiques, is prized for the beauty, simplicity, and sturdiness found in such things as their furniture. A good example is sandwich glass, which was made in the town of Sandwich on Cape Cod from a secret formula now lost. The glass is famous for its coloring. But Yankee ingenuity is found in the invention of playthings as well as in serious manufactures. The swan boats in Boston's public gardens are enjoyed by the children of all ages. Yet with typical New England thrift, they are driven by foot power. Another example of Yankee ingenuity is the Cog Railway running to the top of New England's highest mountain, Mount Washington which rises 6,200 feet above sea level and a mile above its New Hampshire Valley floor. The Cog Railway was built in 1869 by Sylvester Marsh and has been popular ever since with New Englanders and visitors alike. The grade is very steep and the engine is built for the grades it finds in ascending a full mile in the three and a half miles of the railroad's length. Because of this sharp rise of the White Mountains above their valley floors, they compare in impressiveness and grandeur with the Rocky Mountains. They are high enough to be seen clearly from the ocean 75 miles away. One of the earliest explorers, Verrazano, reported seeing these mountains in the year 1508. Mount Washington is the highest of eight mountains in New Hampshire that are more than a mile high. The White Mountain National Forest, some 1,200 square miles, also contributes to four river systems. The mountains are well forested except above timberline where the vegetation corresponds to that of Greenland. At the summit there is a magnificent view, a hundred miles in all directions. Close at hand are other mountains of the presidential range named for presidents Jefferson, Adams, Madison and the like. They are all part of a view that extends north to Maine, east to Vermont and New York, south to Massachusetts. Near Franconia Notch, a few miles from Mount Washington, the mountains can be seen close up in a quicker way. An aerial car like those used in the Alps goes up the mountain on high cables, safely and easily, swinging out into space high above the lakes and trees. The forests that cover more than half of New England, the northern part with its spruce, fir, beech, birch, and maple. The southern part with its oak, hickory, pine, hemlock. Again at a summit, a peak is reached, not only of a mountain, but of a glimpse at the character of New England. For New England is more than a section of land. It is a people, a set of ideals and a way of living. Its history is one with that of the whole United States. It is as American as baseball, the Boston Braves or the Red Sox and the enthusiastic crowds of all nationalities that support them are all one with the nation. The game is the same whether it is played in Chicago, San Francisco, New Orleans. Like football, a Yale-Princeton game played in the Yale Bowl, New Haven, Connecticut. The crowds, the people are the same. But in the forming of this nation, the people of New England have been the pioneers. Their heritage is the rich one of seeing long struggles come to fruition. They have conquered a land, made it a home, fought for ideals, and built a culture of which they may be justly proud. The seacoast may well stand as a symbol of this heritage that New England offers its sons and daughters and all Americans so that they may go forward today guided and strengthened by the courage and high tradition 
of old New England. Thank you.